Greetings. Welcome to this talk on my brand new book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. And I'm excited to be here to share this with you today. In every spiritual tradition, saints and poets speak of the soul's search for the beloved the seeker's yearning for the divine, for the self beyond ego. And this holy longing is a secret feeling with many disguises, leading us to pursue a higher union in spiritual practice, religious discipleship, and even romantic embrace. It guides us to timeless wisdom and transcendent experiences. But it also can go awry when we project the divine onto a teacher, priest, guru, rabbi, or roshi, who's all too human, who has unhealed wounds, undeveloped empathy, maybe even authoritarian tendencies. In effect, a woman or man who has a shadow and if he or she abuses power, whether the abuse is sexual, financial, or emotional coercion, we feel the shock of betrayal, our innocence lost, and our faith shaken. We might say he can't be enlightened as he claimed, or she has secrets and she's not who I thought she was, or the priest lied and the congregation was duped. In our time, we've witnessed many contemporary teachers of Buddhism, Hinduism, Hasidism, Islam, Catholicism, and Protestant groups act out their shadows in destructive ways, leaving their followers traumatized and lost. And some of us have experienced religious or spiritual abuse firsthand and its consequent heartbreak and disillusionment but we may not have had spiritual shadow work to help us rekindle the flame of longing in our souls. And most people have not had theosophy's understanding that good and evil qualities are both equally present in the divine source of all things. As Madame Blavatsky pointed out, evil is not an independent reality but the complement or shadow of good. In the secret doctrine she wrote, self-existent evil is only the shadow of light, without which light could have no existence. If evil disappeared, good would disappear along with it, unquote. And she added, the dark angels are cosmic powers that guide the involution of the universe but they're also psychological forces from our past that shape our responses to the present, end quote. So these dark angels will be my focus for today. Daily accounts of the eruption of human shadow bombard us in the social and political arenas with darkness blocking the light, just as in an eclipse. Today, our focus moves from the headlines to the eruption of human shadow in a spiritual or religious context. And let me point out that I'm not discussing metaphysics. I'm applying depth psychology to the spiritual search. We live through a tidal wave of Catholic priest child sexual abuse scandals in the 80s, which continue even today, this week in the news. We've lived through social media and published reports of teachers in every tradition who claim the highest reaches of human consciousness, but who act out sexual assault, emotional abuse, and financial coercion in the extreme. Hindu swamis, Zen roshis, Tibetan lamas, Hasidic rabbis, Protestant clergy, and yet we continue to imagine 
a spiritual life without an encounter with human darkness. Why do we continue to be shocked and betrayed when it erupts? The Me Too movement went viral in 2017 to raise awareness of sexual violence in the workplace, military, universities, and other secular settings, but it didn't publicly address abuse in the religious or spiritual context. The movement helped survivors and witnesses to connect online, empower each other, and encourage whistleblowers. And in some spiritual communities, all powerful teachers could no longer control the narratives in their isolated kingdoms. Many fled the country or lost legal battles. In chapter five of this new book, I tell the tales of many dozens of renowned teachers who fell from grace. We know from theosophy that the shadow is non-denominational. And we know that the inner teacher, the self, is the ultimate guide. These stories of meeting the shadow on the spiritual path can lead to an eclipse, the darkness overcoming the light in disillusionment and loss of faith. So we need spiritual shadow work to reclaim our projections and rekindle our yearning. When a group of Tibetan Buddhist survivors of abuse provided a document of allegations to the Dalai Lama, it was called Me Too Guru. It's evident from my research that we also need a spiritual justice movement but only 13 states have penal statutes that support the criminal prosecution of clergy for sex with the congregant. From childhood through late life, many of us long for God or spirit, transcendence, a sense of the divine. When you imagine God, what do you see? A stern bearded male perched on a throne with angels circling his head. A beatific Madonna with an innocent child at her breast. A black four-armed goddess dancing on a corpse. Indra's net as it weaves through and interconnects all living beings. The letters of a holy name a colorful mandala, a sacred mountain, a sparkling void. Each religion comes with its own images of God and they may inspire awe, love, fear, guilt, or doubt. In some Eastern traditions, they're objects of contemplation, evoking spiritual qualities in the aspirant. Carl Jung explored the God image in myth and in the psyches of his patients. For me, the God image is the hidden object of desire, typically hidden in the unconscious shadow, but pointing to something beyond ego and arousing our holy longing. When we find a sacred teacher or spiritual guide, who evokes our soul's longing. Our image of God leaps out of our inner world onto an idealized human being. And we're filled with exalted feelings of devotion in the presence of our ideal. In our psyches, the teacher, priest, guru, rabbi, roshi, lama, sheikh, has realized in human form the ideal other living within the student, the image of the complete or self-realized human being. So within the inner world of the student, the teacher carries the student's own highest authority, the parent who won't fail him, the godlike human who she's, who, whose attributes she strives to emulate. And for the student to recognize the teacher as such, there must be a match between the inner image and the outer person. 
the arrow of projection hits the target and a student feels a fit, an inner yes. Carl Jung called this an archetypal projection, distinct from a personal parental projection. He uncovered through a patient's dream that this patient was turning him into a god. Like that woman, we are all unconsciously attributing godlike status to spiritual teachers. And once activated, this projection holds a promise and a duty, an inspiration and a burden. On the flip side, the teacher basks in the admiration and devotion of the student. In some cases, teachers unconsciously come to depend on this adoration, like food. And so they behave in ways that exact exclusive obedience from their followers. With a lack of moral development, they may act out their shadows in destructive ways to maintain the relationship. So what would lead us, independent, developed adults, to endow another human being with so much power and authority that we feel blind faith in him or her? Our tender longings activate vulnerable feelings of childhood devotion, childlike devotion. Sorry. As Freud pointed out, each of us carries unmet childhood needs into adulthood, like an unconscious longing to merge with a powerful figure for protection against frightening feelings of powerlessness or abandonment. And so we are susceptible to the vagaries of human authorities who appear to be benign. Freudians believe only in the influence of our personal histories. So for them, our longing for an almighty other can refer only to a parent and religion is a replay of childhood. But we know from Carl Jung that archetypal projection is hidden beneath and behind the parental projection. Let me step back just to be sure that we're all on the same page in our understanding of projection. When two people meet and feel a deep connection, their hearts open and so do their imaginations. Through projection, the shadow or unconscious mind expels both positive and negative traits by attributing them to the other person and disowning them in ourselves. It's like we carry an archer's quiver on our backs and every so often an arrow shoots out. Oh, that person is stupid or that person is lazy or that person is so wise and enlightened. And so we may say something nasty or we may fall in love. And in our discussion here, we may begin to surrender to a teacher. Our early needs to feel special to be seen, to keep secrets, to feel belonging, are all at play. And some of us unconsciously seek teachers like our parents. Others seek those who are different. But in the unconscious, the shadow has its own agenda. People may meet teachers who seem at a conscious level to be the opposite of their parents. But later, when the shadow erupts, they discover that he or she is a lot like a parent. For instance, a teacher may appear to be gentle and compassionate, but when he's angry, he becomes a critical know-it-all, just like a woman's father. Or when he begins to gain wealth, he becomes a materialistic consumer just like a student's family. Or when his sexuality is not processed, he may begin to seduce women with promises of enlightenment, urging her to keep his secret 
just like family secrets. It's an unconscious match. The shadow in each of them is unconsciously recreating the parent-child relationship. And this is bringing an opportunity to become more self-aware, to heighten our consciousness, and to learn spiritual shadow work. So what happens when that projection rattles? If this happened to you, did you experience abuse of power? sexual coercion, financial coercion? Was it covert abuse or overt abuse? Or were you a witness to the abuse of others? Let's explore each of these a little bit more now. Our clergy and spiritual teachers, even when awake in advanced stages of consciousness, are still human and certainly not perfect. As a teacher's ego becomes inflated with success, surrounded by adoring followers and the props of a lineage, he or she may come to feel the right to sit on a golden throne and increase his authority without limits. Using power to serve the ego's agenda, the teacher's danger grows. Soon he does not have power, power has him. And it becomes an unconscious complex, acted out on the most sacred arena of life. Teachers and clergy may subject their followers to verbal abuse, shaming, physical violence, emotional control, withholding of love and approval, and threats of punishment and expulsion. Power and sex go hand in hand. An incursion may be careless or aggressive, subtle or traumatic. But many teachers and clergy use sex to express power, intimidate others, and feed their own emptiness. And in particular, a culture's deeply ingrained traditions of misogyny and objectification may engender in male teachers a shadow that allows them to use women, men, girls or boys as objects for their own gratification. The high profile cases of the Me Too movement reposed questions about power and gender. Who has the power and who doesn't? Who has consent? Can someone consent if her career, education, mental health, financial well being, or in this case, spiritual well being, is controlled by the person who wants sex? Can she consent if she's told she'll be excommunicated? or her family will go to hell, or her karma will be damaged for lifetimes if she refuses. The power differential between religious clergy and their acolytes makes consent questionable. Like sex, money can become the ego's tool. It's the root of all evil and it's the grail we seek. It carries the projection of divine energies and can be worshiped like a false god in the form of a private jet, a shiny Rolls Royce, a golden throne. Financial coercion can be covert, beginning with tithing and leading to overt abuse, such as when a teacher demands access to a student's income or inheritance. The reports of so many teachers living lifestyles of excess in contrast to their teachings, and also in contrast to those who serve them, are deeply disheartening. And some teachers even claim that salvation or enlightenment lies in giving them sex or money. They promise these gifts will carry their followers to heaven 
or to higher stages of consciousness. In either case, the broken promise is devastating. So when examined together, the incidents of spiritual abuse reveal patterns across all the denominations. The relationship can be the most sacred of a lifetime. And we invest it with our hearts and minds and we entrust it with our souls. We're reluctant to find fault and we deny violations of trust because of that investment. If the relationship fails, it invalidates our own judgment and the very vision to which we've devoted our lives. So denial is epidemic. Although a group's teachings and practices may be valuable and life enhancing, its organizational structures may be authoritarian or its members' behaviors may be compulsive or cult-like. They often resemble the coping strategies that we see in alcoholic families. So I'm just gonna read this quickly for you. A priest or teacher exploits others for her own narcissistic needs. The transgressions are often boundary violations. The member chosen for abuse is made to feel special. Others enable the abusive behavior and members deny their own doubts and intuition that something is wrong. They seek to maintain the projection at all costs. They rationalize, they use spiritual teachings to rationalize hurtful behavior. Shameful secrets glue the system together and members are threatened with retaliation for disclosure or for wanting to leave. So what are the consequences of religious or spiritual betrayal? For many people, at some point, the projection pops. Denial breaks down, rationalization no longer holds, and the defenses against the truth of religious abuse collapse. Following the shock, that most people feel after meeting the shadow on the spiritual path. Many suffer from symptoms of PTSD, nightmares, flashbacks, irritability, self-destructive behavior, guilt, and shame. Some succumb to rage, blaming the church or Sangha, God, or themselves. Their feelings of betrayed trust lead them to distrust others. Others succumb to depression. They lose their community, their purpose, the meaning that glued their life together. They regret the time lost. They feel guilty about the lies or deceptions they colluded with. They feel ashamed for having been duped. And they struggle with loneliness, sexuality, finances, and other delayed developmental issues that were put aside when they lived in the community. In the 1990s, Yogi Amrit Desai, an adept in Kundalini Yoga um, and founder of Kripalu Yoga Ashram in Massachusetts, taught his community that sex would slow their progress to awakening and that celibacy would enhance spiritual energy. When a woman disciple told others that she had sex with Desai because he told her it was a gift and a privilege, he denied her story. The denial was accepted by the community, even by the woman's husband and son who remained at the ashram after she left. And then another woman came forward with the same claim. And this time, Amrit Desai admitted both affairs, made a public apology, and resigned. 
His students were outraged, heartbroken, and demoralized. The man who carried the image of the divine human had violated the moral code he imposed on them. And as the projection of his infallibility cracked, long buried resentment surfaced and the community fractured. In the traditional guru role, Desai responded by trying to teach surrender, love and selfless service. Later, Kripali staff brought in a diverse group of therapists to assist them to resolve emotional issues that years of yoga practice had left untouched in the shadow. The community was reorganized in a more egalitarian mold with a council of residents and payment for individual seva for service. Yogi Desai learned about projection, coming to understand that his Indian model didn't address early childhood wounds around authority and self-expression. This is a rare example of communal shadow work in which the teacher confesses and tries to make amends. Individual members are supported in their healing and the systems are reorganized to reflect the new understanding. In another example that's in my book, you can read about LA Zen Center following scandals of sexual abuse by its male Roshi. The woman Roshi who took over revamped the institution and altered the power dynamics and the communication style and embraced shadow work. And then there's individual recovery and shadow work. At some point, we can no longer tolerate being the subject of overt shaming or violence. Or a woman can no longer tolerate being a witness of hypocrisy and coercion. The moments of choice come and go as she or he calculates the risk of staying and the risks of leaving. And this is a tense, painful period filled with fear, confusion, guilt, and loss for anyone in a church, synagogue, sangha, or, gen or zenda. If the student can break through denial and begin self-reflection, here are some questions to start the journey. And this is a section in the second half of the book that's about spiritual shadow work. Reflect on your role in relation to your teacher. Are you obedient, dependent, childlike, repeating family patterns? Do you feel more free and authentic or more trapped and controlled? Can you feel the tension between your devotion and your growing individuality and need for autonomy? What did you give away in projection to your idealized teacher? What did he or she carry for you? And what did you banish into your own shadow as a result? Here are some prompts. Have you given away your spiritual essence? Have you projected your spiritual authority? What do you attribute to the teacher and disown in yourself? Have you projected your certainty and banished your doubts? Have you accepted others' definitions of moral behavior and of spirituality? And what do you need in order to reclaim your critical thinking? Which of your beliefs need to be questioned now because they no longer serve you? 
Which of your images of the divine no longer serve you? How are these beliefs and images affecting your feelings about who you are? And if you're an elder, how are they affecting your feelings about mortality? Have you cultivated a spiritual persona that narrows your range of feeling? I certainly did that in my 20s in my first meditation community. No anger, no sadness. They were not acceptable in that community. If you were meditating, you were supposed to be happy. What is your biggest fear of reclaiming these feelings? And what do you need to feel safe to reclaim these feelings? Do you believe the impulses of the body are dangerous temptations? Which bodily sensations have you forbidden? What would happen if you began to allow them to arise? And what do you need for that to feel safe? Have you become passive, submissive, giving up action in your own behalf? Are you unable to feel or express doubt or questions? What do you need to act in your own behalf and reclaim your agency? What do you need to separate from an abusive relationship or community? If we've sacrificed our capacity to question authority and think critically, our capacity to feel deeply and honor those feelings, our capacity to detect bodily cues and sense our own spiritual power, then we will become childlike and submissive and we won't be able to leave an abusive discipleship. We won't be able to shift from victim or bystander to whistleblower. So these um, prompts take time for self-reflection, for journaling, for talking to a close friend, an ally, or a therapist, and allowing the material from the shadow to emerge. Because with the collapse of the projections, the real inner work begins. We begin to see through the projections to the humanity in the other person his darkness and light, her fallibility and divinity. And slowly we come to see that our guide, mentor, guru is not responsible for carrying the divine for us. What they carried for us was inside of us all along. And as we begin to do this work and reclaim our projections and carry our own wounds and carry our own greatness, we need others in a different way. Not to parent us, not to connect us to the divine, but to join us in the dance between love and freedom, union and autonomy. The promise of spiritual shadow work may be different for different seekers. Some will leave a teacher and continue a practice. Others will stay and reimagine a healthier, supportive model of community. But the holy longing for union with the divine fuels the evolution of consciousness in all of us, and the reality of spiritual awakening awaits. A fortunate few find the narrow path through the darkness and undergo initiation. We travel from spiritual innocence through the dark descent 
toward a new level of consciousness, spiritual maturity. We evolve from dependency on a spiritual parent through meeting the shadow toward spiritual adulthood. Having been emptied out of old ideas and images and left fallow for a dark season, we become fertile soil for new life. Open, but not naive. Eager, but not impatient. Ripe for blossoming. And with practice, we learn to meet the shadow in ourselves and in our teachers, gradually coming to accept it as a part of being human, but no longer susceptible to its abuse. We can see our own shadows, accept our limitations, and empathize more deeply. And for some, this requires separation from a teacher and community. For others, it requires becoming a whistleblower, but staying to redesign the group. In the end, shadow work for spiritual abuse requires that we reclaim lost parts of the self and permit new feelings and images to emerge. I'm calling for a reimagination of spiritual life that expands to include the human shadow. It's not absent in anyone. It's not going anywhere. It's part of the path. But it's not the whole story. The human soul's longing for transcendence, awakening, the divine beloved, the higher self, is the central mystery of a human life. And for some, it's purpose. So to follow our holy longing, we must ask, what is spiritual integrity? To me, it means living with the awareness of our interdependence with all life. And so the need for compassion for all living things. If we don't have the direct experience of that interconnection, we can hold the knowledge of it and act accordingly. And this includes inner work on our moral development. It includes speaking and behaving with honesty and transparency, not secrecy. It includes living with congruence. We do what we say, not hypocrisy. It includes personal shadow awareness, taking responsibility when our shadows act out. This then is the dance of darkness and light in our search for awakening. And I want to conclude by opening an invitation to anyone who would like to read the new book and who's interested in doing spiritual shadow work with community support. I'm going to be forming groups of um, people to read the book together and do practices together. They're free and they're online. And so they'll be organized by time zones. And if this interests you, you can shoot me an email, connieswide at gmail.com. And please put in the subject line, spiritual shadow work groups. And let me know your time zone. And I will connect you with other people who want to do this work in community. So thank you for the privilege of your time and attention, and I wish you all well.